Classical Conversation Studios presents Refining Rhetoric with CEO Robert Bortons, a podcast where faith, business, politics, and classical education meet. Join us as we use the classical tools of rhetoric to seek truth in every arena of life. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Refining Rhetoric. Today, my guest is Joyce Burgess. Joyce is the CEO and co-founder, along with her husband, Eric, of the National Black Home Educators, an organization providing resources to help make homeschooling more accessible in the United States. She's also an experienced homeschool mom for over 30 years and the author of several books, including Teach Me How to Teach My Child, A Gentlewoman's Guide to Greatness, and A Home Educator's Guide to Greatness. As a national speaker and advocate for topics like education and family, Joyce and her work have been featured on The New York Times, CNN, MSNBC, US Today, Fox News, Ebony, Essence, and many other news and media outlets. Joyce, welcome oh, to the show. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Joyce, something I'm starting to do on this podcast is first ask my guest to define truth. So how do you define truth? Wow. <laughs> I define truth. It's, it's very simple. It's very basic. It's just knowing that God is omnipresent, but he's also personally in our lives and accepting the fact that we can live out God's principles and we can live out the laws. But, you know, it's not just that it's principles and laws, but it's, it's a relationship with Christ. It's a relationship with God. And just knowing that he loves us, he cares for us, and just basically knowing that he is sovereign. Oh, I love that answer. That's a, a beautiful answer and one I can definitely relate to. Tell us, uh, tell our audience about your homeschool journey. I know that uh, you and your husband, Eric, were kind of some of the pioneers, uh, kind of like uh, my family. Uh, so why did you start homeschooling and how did that impact your sure. family? It was about 35 years ago, probably a little more than 35 years ago. My husband and I received a phone call from our son's school that he had dropped two points below their acceptable grade average. You know, in public schools, they're graded every year. And if a child drops below a particular grade average, uh, the acceptable grade average when they enter the school, then they start concerned. They start getting concerned. And so they reached out to us and told us that what had happened. And they gave us a couple of options. Some of those options was private school, or we can take them to a school way across town, you know, maybe 45 minutes from where we lived. And of course, neither of those answers was something we wanted to do. So at that point, we just decided to investigate, uh, explore some options through our church. And that one of those options was homeschooling. And um, I asked the uh, lady who shared it with me, when can I start? And she was like, you can start right away. So we just started <laughs> homeschooling our son. We had about four children at the time. And we let the other two stay in public school for the remainder of the school year. But that time of homeschooling our son, it gave us six months to really get to know him and for him to get to know us. You know, homeschooling is, is, is a relationship with your children. And so we've been homeschooling. We have uh, five children that we've homeschooled. We've homeschooled two other children as well that came to live with us for a period of time. And it's just been one of the best decisions. Now, looking back, it's been one of the best decisions that we could have made for our children, but more than anything for our family and for our legacy. That's a beautiful story. And like, what gave you the confidence to homeschool um, because there wasn't a, the resources that are available now to a homeschooling family weren't available back then. So take us through that, that thought process. You know, at first I did feel that, wow, I'm going to ruin my son's life. But I think knowing that what, when you asked me about the question about what is truth and just knowing that God wants what is best for us and that we can always go to the Lord for answers to our questions. That gave me my first level of confidence to believe that if God brought me through this, if God put this in our laps, then God's going to help us to make it. But, you know, that took a lot of um, petitioning God, uh, being patient, 
uh, thinking about how committed I wanted to be. So I took it year by year, honestly. I didn't even share with my husband that I was taking this year by year, <laughs> but essentially we did. We did. I, I said, you know, I'm just going to see what happens. But every year God met us. And then just the fact that I'm his parent, uh, I'm his mother, and I'm the only one with a vested interest in my children's life, rather for good or rather for bad. Amen. And so based upon that, that gave me the boost I needed to get in there. You know, there are some personal things you have to work through. Like I said earlier, patience, uh, your level of dedication and commitment. Uh, you know, if you're going to get out and be among other people, like in support groups, were there any curriculum out there available for, you know, specifically for African-Americans. But I knew that I was good in certain things like English. I'm a singer. I'm good in music. And I said, if I don't do anything but teach him that, he still will be way ahead of what the norm is. So. <laughs> yes. Oh, I love it. Now, the one thing that I really enjoy about homeschooling parents and families is their entrepreneurial spirit and their grassroots efforts. And uh, for you all, and uh, like many homeschoolers, we just found that there wasn't a lack of curriculum that kind of aligned uh, with what we wanted to learn. And uh, instead of complaining about it, you all went out and created something, the National Black Home Educators uh, organization NBHE, which I think is over 20 years now, which, wow, what an accomplishment. Congratulations. Um, I can imagine maybe what some of the answers might look like, but you know, what did you see that caused you to, uh, create this organization and, uh, you know, what was uh, that initial effort behind it, um, for what were you trying to do? Initially, we wanted to share our story. We wanted African-Americans to know that homeschooling is applicable for you as well. You know, we got a lot of pushback uh, from our own culture saying that we were Benedict Arnolds because Dr. Martin Luther King and others fought very hard for equality in public schools and in education, and why do you and your family want to come away from that? When we started the organization, we wanted to empower parents. We wanted to let them know that this is for you. This is, this applies for, to you. Here are some country. Here are some a, uh, examples of blacks who were actually homeschooled. We also got some pushback from just a few, but I can say most of. Caucasian community or white America, most of them, I would say about 90% of them were very, very supportive. But we did get, you know, just a little teasing, so to speak, uh, you know, why, uh, why do you guys want to start something different? It sounds like you're being prejudiced. Sounds like, you know, this is a race thing. And, you know, it was not that at all. It was basically we wanted to share with black families because we saw African-Americans, especially young boys, really suffering and not getting that one-on-one custom design education that they so deserved. And we just wanted to be a, a, a help. I think about my husband, and this is a story he tells people, you know, when Moses went before Pharaoh to let people go, let the Israelis go, God uh, just put this mantle up on him. And Moses was like, you know, but I'm the one who is so inadequate to do this major job. And God said, what is in your hand? And of course, Moses told him what was in his hand. And so God just told me and my husband, who are you? You know, there are certain things you're never, ever going to change about yourself. And one of them is you are a black American. And so based upon that, that gave us the boost, you know, the confidence to just go ahead, uh, hook a crook, uh, fall or, or be successful. But we're going to do this not just for black Americans, because we're not an organization that want to keep people out. Everybody needs to know about everybody's history, everybody's culture. You know, my family looks like heaven. We have, I have a Caucasian daughter-in-law. I have a Filipino son-in-law. And we just look like heaven. All these beautiful different shades of 
who we are as people. It. And so based upon that, we just want people to know our history. We want people to know about our culture so that we can be comfortable with one another and love one another. And I must say, by the grace of God, it is working. It's working. Well, I love that. And there's always going to be naysayers uh, for, for whatever reason, I think. Uh, but it's great to hear your story and empowering through that. I know even like when we started homeschooling, our family, you know, our grandparents were like, oh, I don't know if this is a good idea and and those type of things. And then, you know, when I was teenagers, like, yeah, we always supported their efforts to, <laughs> to homeschool. So yeah, uh, it's, it's amazing how the narrative changes over time. Well, I just admire your family and what you all have done and tried to support because we, you know, I noticed we have families in our community that are part of the work that you, that that you do. And sometimes I've gone to those meetings. I've even spoken at some of them. So I admire, I've admired for years and I've even used your, your story as an example to help us move forward as encouragement and inspiration for moving forward. Well, Joyce, that's humbling to hear you say, and I, and I appreciate it. And uh, it's been great to, you know, s- sit next to you in, in a few conferences and get to know you a little bit uh, throughout the years. What are some of the, um, besides telling your story, what are some of the other things that uh, NBHE has accomplished or, or what, are you, what do you offer to your members or to society at large? Okay, good. That's a good question. One of the things we've done since we started is we wanted to start a conference. We wanted to give people an opportunity to gather. And, you know, one of the things I've always admired about going to conferences is seeing speakers and seeing their um, exhibit halls full of amazing books. And so we started a conference some years ago, way before, you know, the, the pandemic. And families would come to what we called called a family conference here in Louisiana, and then eventually it moved from Louisiana to Atlanta and Houston, Texas. And it was just a conference where African Americans could see themselves in speaking form so that they could relate to that. I'm not the only one out there. We also had exhibit hall where there were African American books. It was more than just the normal uh, ones that you see in your everyday exhibit halls like Dr. Martin Luther King, Frederick Douglass, George Washington, you know. So it was more of the resources about the contributions of African Americans and just stories and series that children could really get involved in. One of the key things that we did, I was so excited about this, is have a showcase where our children could come and showcase their talent, whether it was music, whether it was dancing, whether it was recitation, or whether it was reenactments, our children could come and they could also showcase who they who they were and some of the things they did as a family. We also had a graduation and we also had an evening where we gathered together in one of our, in our state house where our officials could acknowledge our children and put homeschooling in that best possible light where these children were acknowledged by elected officials and given certain certificates and even trophies. But one of the things that I'm very excited about is what we're doing now. And that is we have through our membership portal, we offer families resources in just about every subject, math, uh, reading, grammar, poetry, art, music, language, just all of those great subjects. And it's just a short little resource, a little supplement to just come along like an add-on to a regular core curriculum where parents will, you know, I've always believed that you should teach children a little bit about everything. And so we give families a little bit in these resources, just about everything, so that their children will have fun. And it's one-on-one, and it's parental interactive, and it's just a, they're just great resources. So that's one thing we're very excited about. We're also excited about our parent forums where we come together on a every two, two months basis, and we have moms that 
share their stories. Uh, they share their weaknesses. They share their strengths so that other parents will be empowered by their stories as well. So I've, I've said a lot. Shall I <laughs> wait for another question? <laughs> yeah, no, I love it. Yeah, no, the supplemental um, resources is wonderful. I know like at Classical Conversations, a lot of people don't understand. Most states, uh, whether you agree with it or not, require students to go to class or have some academics 180 days a year, which is basically uh, 36 weeks of school. Uh, and for our for our Foundations Through Essentials program at Classical Conversations, it's only a 24-week program. So you have another 12 weeks of opportunities to supplement uh, your child's education. And even for our challenge program, it, we, we go a total of 30 weeks, so you have another six weeks to supplement it. So you always have time, if you are in classical conversations, to d dig deeper or, or dive into an area that's not covered yeah. uh, in our core curriculum. And so something like those resources there would be great uh, for families and um you know, I think that those forums, the stories, being able to inspire others, um, tell failures, tell of how we helped each other out is just um, powerful. And so I applaud you for uh, doing both of those things. Yeah. And we also partnered with Google to teach our children about coding. We have an event that goes on on Saturdays where we have children all over the country. They come together and they, they go into the virtual scene and the metaverse, meta universe, I think that's what they call it. And these children have an opportunity to create coding, um, coding portals. They have an opportunity to develop their leadership skills through that. I actually went into one of the virtual settings with some of the students one day, and it was so funny when I entered in, one of the little girls, she was six years old at the time, and she, I, I couldn't get in because I'm not very techie, but she said, okay, Miss Joyce, I see you, I'm coming to get you. And you could see her <laughs> little avatar come down to, you know, help me through the maze of the virtual setting. So we have that and we also have a uh, path, which is what I mentioned earlier. Path is parents uh, at home, parents, teachers at home. And um, that's where we have these parental sessions every two or three months to invite moms or dads because we don't want to leave the dads out nope. <laughs> because there are some fathers who are very in are very vested in the everyday academic part of homeschooling so we're very excited about the relationship that we have with google and that we this they provide this opportunity for us to enter into coding mm -hmm. yeah that's great i learned to code early on. Now I can't install printer drivers without the help of IT, but but I used to be able to <laughs> be on the forefront of all that. And I think it's a valuable skill because it gets people to think logically. Um, it's also uh, part of development of language. Yeah, and it's a safe environment. Uh, the Google trainer that, we, that we've been using, she's a Christian, and it's just a wonderful experience. It's civil. Uh, the children have learned, and, and we've been at this now for the last two and a half years. We've been doing this, and these children are faithful every Saturday to come on um, the Google Meet or the Zoom. Well, wonderful. I know uh, through the pandemic that we saw a rise in homeschooling in general, but it's something that was really encouraging to me and I think probably encouraged you too was just the rise of Black families homeschooling you know, I've seen uh, statistics that suggested maybe almost uh, one in six uh, black children in the U.S. were being homeschooled at some point. Uh, I know that uh, homeschooling in general has gone back down uh, as uh, schools have opened up and different things. But what did you see uh, with your organization? Were you guys just fielding requests left and right, helping people get started? And have you have you seen that continue on or is that drop back down? You know, it was such a beautiful thing to see so many families choosing to homeschool. I mean, at that time, it was like you had no choice. 
<laughs> but it was so beautiful to see these families interacting with their children and asking the questions. And many of them decided, you know what? I'm going good. I'm just going to continue to homeschool. Uh, a lot of parents are working out of their homes, working remotely. Uh, during that time, they got a chance to start their own businesses. Rather, I, I know this one lady, and it's so, it was such a powerful testimony. She, her daughter was in public school. Of course, they had to go to the virtual setting. Right. She decided to start baking for her neighbors who were at home, you know, just in her neighborhood, just giving brownies or cupcakes to the children. And it got so popular for her until she started her own business. Now she has a cupcake business and her daughter is still homeschooling. And this all came out of, you know, what we were all dealing with. And, um, but I'm seeing a lot of families just decide to continue it. I believe that it's going to grow even more because we have seen, we have been so busy with creating our supplements. You know, we have new supplements coming out now, like writing. We have seen that increase so much until they're not going to go, they're not going to necessarily go back simply because they're learning about who they are. They're learning about their culture. Uh, they are excited about, we even have a, a group or a forum that just talks about the musical part of our supplements. During the, during the mm. pandemic, a lot of people who teach music, like one of my sons is a piano instructor. He had to go online, of course. And a lot of that, they're having parent forms where they're actually discussing the NBHE musical or composers supplement just to get, keep the children excited about, you know, piano practicing. Lots of kids don't care to practice. They want to play piano, but they don't want to practice. Yeah. And so that that forum keeps these parents in, encouraged to continue to press. I don't want to use the word make a force, <laughs> but to press these children to see the value of practicing the instrument that they've chosen to take and to stick with it and not just start something and stop. Yeah. I can relate to the children because I think my mom made me take piano for two years, but she she thinks it was only three months. So. <laughs> but but now as an adult, I wish I had had the wisdom as a child to stick with it and continue to learn. So I understand. And, you know, because I don't know why things were the way they were, you know, with African-American contributors into this country, like African-American heroes during the American Revolutionary War, right. African-American heroes during the Civil War. I don't know why those things were not put into your mainstream historical curriculum, but now that the National Black Home Educators exist, we are on top of that. And, and it's so exciting, it's so encouraging to see how African-Americans entered into the American Revolutionary War. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you one example. George Washington, of course, you know, he owned slaves. But there was a, a, a slave girl, but well, she really wasn't a slave. But, you know, this family, you know, saw her, they, they paid for her, but they didn't really treat her that way. They didn't treat her like a slave. She was a writer. She was a poet. And that's Phyllis Wheatley. And George Washington you know, through a lot of the emotions I'm sure he was experiencing with the war, this young lady would write poems. And she chose to do it from a positive perspective. You know, not, not write a poem and say, you know, you bad George Washington, you know, you're evil man. She wrote it from a way of uplifting him and causing him to think about what is really happening here. Mm. I mean, do you really want to own someone? Is that really what God has um, equipped or designed for you to do? And of course, through her poetry, she began to touch his heart. I know she did because of the relationship that was eventually developed between the two. So I have no idea why things were not put in, but I do know now 
we have this great opportunity to share with people, not just black people, but all people, we have this great opportunity to share our history and our stories. You know, and I can go on and on about stories of Eleanor Roosevelt, who was one of my, he's one of my heroes and how she came to talk with Marian Anderson after, you know, a certain group didn't want her, didn't want Marian Anderson to perform in mm. their meeting house. And she came in and said, hey, they don't want you, we want you. And she performed before 75,000 people in the rain, my country tears of thee, at the Lincoln Memorial. I mean, how beautiful is that? You know, when I think about it, I can, you know, tears almost come to my eyes because there, everybody is, is not going to go the other way. There are some people who see the big picture and they see God's hand in the midst of our situations. And they come in and they step in and they do the right thing. So we have all of these great supplements and with all of these wonderful stories. And a lot of these stories are integrated, just like what I just shared with you. Yeah, They're integrated because together, these people made America amazing. Mm. That's wonderful. One of the things I uh, did as a as a high school student, I took some dual enrollment classes and uh, I actually took it at uh, Winston-Salem State University, which is an HBU. And the very first class that I chose to take was uh, American Af- African-American history in the United States. And, you know, n- nobody has time to learn everything, but just the stories and the history that I was able to pick up in that one semester just gave me a broader view and just re- reminded myself and really that everything isn't always as it appears. And there's always, of course, you have your heroes that you kind of put up on stage, but there's always all those individuals around them that allow them to, to get where they are and, and how important it is to, you know, can't be aware, you know, there's a billion people on the planet there, you know, there's billions of stories, but and important for us to, you know, go out and try to understand other people's perspective and what else is going around us. That's Cause right. like you said, the, the mainstream, you know, we know that that's a, a poor education because we see the results all around us and it's important to broaden our horizon, in my opinion. You know, I'm sure as you have uh, explored black history and trying to find resources for individuals, you know, what are some names or some, some things that happened that uh, you would encourage people to look into? I mean, you've mentioned two of them already, but is there any other that stand out to you that uh, maybe a story that could be known by more people? Uh, yeah, there's the story of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln and the enlistment of black soldiers into the Civil War. But not only the enlistment, but the compensation of these soldiers in the war. Um, it was it's just, you know, it was just something that was needed. You know, if they were going to fight you know, a lot of uh, people during the day, they didn't think that African-Americans had the military skill nor the military mentality to be successful in a campaign. But uh, uh, Frederick Douglass spoke on behalf mm. of these soldiers, these men who were fighting. And they were fighting because they loved this country. You know, they really did. And so, but I, I also want to recommend to families Check into AfriClassical.com because I'm a musician vocally. I wanted to know who were the African-Americans during the 18th, 17th, and 19th centuries, the classical aspect of music. You know, I love Mozart, Bach, uh, Handel, and Chopin, absolutely, especially on a rainy day like it is here in Louisiana, love that. But I also love Florence Price, you know, and William Steele Grant, and many, many others. If you go to the website, it's africlassical.com. You will see just hundreds of composers. And then I think about the artist. There's a book that I got, and it's it's been a long time, but it's African-Americans in art, the history of African-Americans 
in art during the 18th and 17th, 19th centuries as well. It's a very, very big book. But I think about people like Henry Oswald Tanner, and I think about Horace Pippin and Robert Duncans and all of these amazing artists who gave us artwork, so to speak, just like Thomas Cole. And so I, I, we, we share all of this with our families as well. So mm, That's great. Now, taking a step back, how do you see like education in, uh, in our country, in the United States, and what, what would you hope changes or, or how can we, you know, maybe not the government schools because maybe they're lost, but uh, for us in private education, you know, what would you love to see? I would really love to see prayer back into our schools. I would love to see our children understand what education is truly about. And it's an investment in yourself. I have the privilege, and I say the God-honored privilege, to serve on my local school board. And I'm also board president. There are so many principles to homeschooling, like the parent relationship with the child, the one-on-one, the customized and tailored curriculum that can be transferred into a public school setting. I know that to be true, Um, especially because I'm in a small community. I have a chance to reach out to parents and have these parent meetings and encourage parents to you know, give children good books and encourage moms to read. And I've seen some of the product or some of the result from having these parent meetings, giving them, if it's a building, one of the things I'm I'm doing in my local community is building local libraries within the homes of these children. Even if it's no more than 10 to 20 books, We're giving these books to these children. And I remember when I gave the books out, one little girl ran up to me and she hugged me. (laughs) You know, it was so sweet because she said, I just finished reading a book before I passed all the books out to the children. She was of the first to receive hers. She said, I just finished a book. And this is the first time I've ever had a book that I can call my own. Oh, it was just such a touching story. And so she went home and it was so crazy because when she went home, her mother, to not to, I didn't know this, but her mom works with a cousin of mine down in the city. And this mother said, guess what my daughter was telling my cousin? She said, my daughter just received a, her first book that she can call her own. And this lady named Joyce Burgess gave it to her. And my cousin was like, that's my cousin. (laughs) You know, so it's just a beautiful thing. I I think we just need to get back to that one-on-one. We may have to just meet the families face-to-face and just tell them, this is your responsibility. Education is your own. If we can share with children that this is your work, just start, you know, from kindergarten on up, just start heading them in the direction. This is your job. This is your work. I'm just here as a guide. Your mom serves as a guide or your parents serve only as a guide to lead you into education. So I think, number one, more parental involvement and letting children know that education is your work. You've got to get this for yourself. And I believe if more homeschool moms, you know, get involved in these communities, we're going to have to get involved in the community. I know we don't always have the time or I know that we don't always want to, but I challenge moms and dads, grandmas, your job is to not done, grandparents. We've got to get involved, whether we're homeschooling or not, we've got to get involved as a community to make things better. Yeah, very true. It's one, one person at a time. Yeah, one person at a time. That's right. Now you talked about, uh, you know, you're serving on the school board and leading that up. So that's one way you serve in your community. Uh, talk about, you know, having grandchildren and great grandchildren. Uh, are you, 
helping them homeschool or giving them advice where they're sending their kids to private school or public school. Tell me about how you're engaging, you know, the, the, the beautiful uh, future generation that your family has. You know what? It's just so beautiful because this is the work that you see on the other side. I mean, I had no idea that, I mean, I always thought that my children would choose to homeschool. It's mm -hmm. not something I was going to make them do. I was just going to suggest, you know, recommend. But I have two of my children, only three of my children have children. Okay. And uh, they've all homeschooled their own kids. I think maybe one of the children may be in a, uh, a kind of like a, a mom's day out for a couple of hours during the morning. But they're all homeschooling their children. And I'm telling you, it is such a beautiful thing to see, to see the, all of the work that you've given as a mom and dad. And now to see that your children, I, I can't remember who said this, but they said, you never know how good you raise your children or what a great job you did with your children until you see your children yeah. uh, raising their kids. And so it's really beautiful. Matter of fact, my husband and I go visit our grandkids. We could go every day. <laughs> but we go you know, several days during the week. And of those several days during the week, we are actively engaged in teaching them. That's wonderful. And I love that. It's, it's just starting all over again. It's beautiful. Mm. Well, I think there's at least two commands in the Bible that talk about serving the next generation's generation. So, I mean, God definitely calls grandparents to be involved in their child, grandchildren's upbringing. And uh, I think you're giving us a great example of how to do that. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's, it's hard to back off. I'm, I'm sorry. Sure, of course. <laughs> you know, it's hard to back off because when you see them doing something, it's like, you want to say, and you didn't do that right. <laughs> or you want to get involved and you want to take the grandbabies and say, come to grandma. You know, my grandchildren call me honey. Uh, I have one granddaughter because I do stickers with her. I've been doing stickers with her since she could move her hands. And she calls me Sticker. <laughs> so it's so funny when I walk through the door, she say, Sticker, you know. But um, it's it's really something, knowing when to back off and knowing when to help. Yeah. So. Yes, yeah, it's tough because you got all the experience, but they have to, <laughs> just like I'm, I have three young kids and my mom, you know, helps out, but she, I'm sure she doesn't give as much advice as she as she would like to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's that's a hard thing to try to, you know, move through. But I think I'm doing okay. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Well, one of the things that I've always heard is if you raise your children, you get to enjoy your grandchildren. If you don't raise your children, you have to raise your grandchildren. Yeah. I don't. I don't know if you've heard of that or. I have not heard of it, but I've seen it. I've seen that principle work, you know. I want to be that grandmother that just, well, you know, sometimes my son will say, well, mom, why didn't you, why didn't you say something to her? I said, well, golly, I want to enjoy her. I don't want to just, you know, be telling her what she can and can't do. I want to be that grandma that, you know, go to grandma and everything's all right. <laughs> well, Joyce, thank you so much for being on the show today and all the work you're doing through uh, National Black Home Educators. Uh, remind our audience uh, where they can connect with you and get those resources that you mentioned today. Absolutely. And I want to say thank you so much for the work you're doing and give, giving me an opportunity just to share my passion and that I love so much. The National Black Home Educators web address is www.nbhe.net. You can contact us via email at contact at nbhe.net. I encourage you to go and join our membership. We also have free materials, uh, resources on our website. We have a blog and read the blog. It's very educational. Matter of fact, you know, this is February where everybody celebrates Black History Month. But I say that Black History Month, and I, I read this yesterday, it said Black History Month is the anniversary, but Black History is 24-7, every day. 
So um, take a look at some of those resources and come be a part of who we are. We need volunteers. You know, we need people who've been blessed by homeschooling to come share your stories. So I'm excited and thank you very, very much. Yeah. Appreciate it. Well, we'll definitely um, check those out and yeah, go to N- nbhe.net and uh, go get all those resources and get plugged in. So Correct. thank you so much. All right, now to one of my favorite segments where we practice the 15 tools of learning. Again, there are five core habits of grammar, five common topics of dialectic, and five canons of rhetoric. And today we're going to talk about uh, my garden, and we are going to uh, talk about year two. Now, in expressing, use the body and sense to share knowledge. I will say that. A garden, especially starting one uh, that's of uh, a, a large, small size, a small, small, more than small uh, one was uh, not necessarily economically beneficial because I had to buy the wood and the containers and all the dirt uh, year one. Uh, but I think that uh, year two, you know, we're going to spread those costs out over multiple years. And so I think that uh, as a gardener, don't expect a good payoff year one, but uh, we'll see what happens in year two. With the five common topics of dialectic, uh, one of the things that I had um, is uh, really testimony, I think, is don't plant six big things of tomatoes because unless you like tomato sauce because I probably could have eaten 20 tomatoes a day and not gotten through all the tomatoes. They also overwhelmed some of my other uh, plants. So I'm definitely going to do a better job this year of planning out the garden, which is a little bit difficult because I, part of the reason that I do garden uh, is so that the kids can learn about gardening, that food just doesn't magically show up in grocery stores and those type of things. But uh, the circumstances that we found ourselves in last year was way too many tomatoes because they happened to thrive in our area. Memory, the five canons of rhetoric, the flooding of words and sensory stimulants associated with an idea. It was uh, wonderful to bite into those watermelons last year that were so fresh. Uh, but they were also very small. And so I remember just having to cut up three or four of them uh, in order to get enough watermelon to really uh, feed the family. So I need to figure out this year how to make the watermelon grow bigger and not just get the size of like a small volleyball, but actually become like the ones you see in the store. So uh, I think growing a garden is uh, beneficial from an educational standpoint. I think uh, eating healthy food that's picked right away is probably beneficial from a a health standpoint and uh, maybe lower some future medical bills, which uh, can't really uh, enumerate. And then um, it was a lot of fun just doing that with the kids and excited that they're a year older, that they can uh, maybe take part in that more effectively and uh, pick up some more more ideas about uh, gardening and where food comes from and the gratefulness we have for God that uh, we don't have to rely on bread alone, uh, but uh, by every word in the Bible. So those are uh, the 15 tools of learning that we are practicing today and a little update on gardening with Robert Borton's season two. Uh, We will see uh, if I do a better job feeding my family from our side yard this year. Thanks for tuning in. And let's get into the next topic. Before getting on with the show, I want to tell you about the Museum of the Bible. If you haven't been, you have to go. It's an absolute must for your next family's vacation to our nation's capital. With a very large museum in Washington, D.C. and traveling exhibits from around the world, the Museum of the Bible brings visitors through an interactive, immersive experience using cutting-edge technology to tell the impact, narrative, and history of the scriptures. And you'll find a lot of the classical conversations program in a lot of their information that you can learn there also uh, great news for cc families you can save on tickets 
Just log into CC Connected to find your Museum of the Bible discount code to apply during checkout. So visit museumofthebible.org to get more information. Now back to the show. Welcome back to another segment on classical crypto. I am filling in uh, for Will. Him and I are tag team in this segment this year. And today I want to talk a little bit about XRP, uh, which is the kind of acronym or the the crypto code, if you would, for uh, Ripple Labs. And uh, currently the SEC is uh, prosecuting them as a security. And uh, the Ripple CEO predicted that this case will be resolved this year. And part of that is because the SEC wants to have crypto registered as a security so that they are the ones that oversee uh, the crypto space, uh, if you were, the ones that would regulate it. Congress hasn't explicitly given it to them, which would be a way they could also create a new uh, government panel or organization that oversaw the crypto space exclusively. I'm a small government person. You know, obviously I'd prefer freedom, but more than likely they're going to um, have some sort of regulation and put that under some three-letter agency. Uh, but does that, the SEC have a good case? Uh, they hope they do. Uh, throughout the years, it has sounded like XRP is uh, doing better than expected. And one of the things that was found out in the case was that SEC employees were actually allowed to buy and sell XRP. Uh, which would not have been allowed under their current rules for securities without following very specific guidelines. So you can imagine that you don't want the the fox guarding the hen house. Uh, so employees of the SEC, they are allowed to buy and sell stocks, which are securities, uh, but they can only do so under certain guidelines where they have to um, kind of hold the stock for a certain period of time. They have to, uh, you know, buy and sell uh, with permissions. So obviously they have insider knowledge and we wouldn't want them to um, be profiting off their insider knowledge. So they, so this is one of the reasons why the XRP uh, team thinks that they have a good case because at one point the SEC clearly did not view them as a security, uh, even though now they are trying to view them in that way. In many ways, it's really just going to give a lot of oversight uh, an understanding of how the government is going to interact uh, in the crypto space once this gets resolved. Uh, XRP is one of the um, use cases that we're seeing uh, that is being adapted already uh, by banks. Uh, it is a payment rail that uh, many overseas entities are uh, working to use to decrease their cost and speed up transaction time. So last time I was on this I talked a little bit about the Lightning Network, and that is built on Bitcoin. So uh, Bitcoin is kind of what they call the layer one, and then the Lightning Network is built on this. Uh, XRP is kind of its own layer one and its own protocols. So these are two real-world examples of how uh, crypto is being used today and how it will be used in the future as always, this is not financial advice. This is for educational purposes only. Uh, be sure to see a professional of which I am not. Uh, so uh, that's, a, that's my disclaimer and I'm sticking to it. Well, I hope you had as much fun today as I did. I really enjoyed listening to Joyce's story. And uh, if you did, please share this with a friend. Be sure to check out their website and be sure to check in next week as uh, we continue practicing the tools of learning here together on the Refining Rhetoric podcast. God bless. Thank you for listening to Refining Rhetoric with Robert Bortons. Want more? Make sure to subscribe so you won't miss an episode. You can also follow us on social media to continue the conversation and visit classicalconversations.com forward slash rhetoric to find out how you can join a local homeschool community.